Oh, boogie right. man Ben coming round the band is boogie man Ben. Is boogie man Ben. Greetings, fellow Fright fans, and thanks so much for dropping by the Horror Zone channel. I hope everyone's doing well. This is going to be the last video I do uh, focusing on Friday the 13th, the series. This is going to be focusing on season three or the final season of the show. Um, the show was canceled uh, before they were able to do like a proper finale. Um, it's been a total blast going back and watching these, as I have had these DVD sets for a long time, but. I haven't really watched the show in a long time. You know, watching all 72 episodes, I can unequivocally say that Friday the 13th, the series, is my favorite show of all time. It really was um, a time in my life that, you know, I was coming to be a young man. I was 13 years old when the show first debuted, and um, I really just really loved the cast, especially John DeLamay, who played Ryan Dalian. And um, season three was a really bitter pill for me to swallow because I found out early on that uh, the Ryan Dalian character was going to be written out of the show. Now, I'll get a little, a little bit more into that as we go through the trivia and some of the behind-the-scenes anecdotes that are found in Elise Wax's book, uh, which has been a terrific resource, as I've said in the other two videos I've done. Curious Goods, uh, Behind the Scenes of Friday the 13th, the series. This is the definitive book on the show, um, even though if I don't agree with everything Elise Wax says about the show or some of the setups for certain episodes, um, I do uh, really appreciate this book, and it does go into some tremendous detail, especially, especially when it comes to like interviews with the cast and crew that worked on the show. Um, it's just a, been an amazing book. Season three was one that uh, I was actually looking forward to revisiting the least, just because um, my favorite character um, was only in one episode. I mean, I think that all three actors really came into their own as the series progressed, and you really loved the dynamic between the three. Um, Chris Wiggins, Roby, and John LeMay all did a great job. You know, you believe that family dynamic and you wanted to root for them in every episode because they were doing something that they didn't have to, but they knew it was the right thing to do. And then in season two, of course, we were introduced to Johnny Ventura, played by Stephen Marnark. Um, he would show up in Wedding Bell Blues and he would have a bigger role in the second to last episode of the season, that being uh, episode 25, The Prisoner. Um, which uh, dealt with his father being murdered and him being uh, framed. And it dealt with this kamikaze jacket and this inmate that had it. It was a great episode. And, um, you know, in Wedding Bell Blues, you find out that, you know, Johnny is up to helping them find more antiques, sort of being a fourth uh, team member of the group. But unfortunately... Um, there was some tensions behind the scenes, and that's what led to John LeMay uh, leaving, uh, sort of almost, you know, uh, doing everything he could to get out of his contract. And and how I found out John LeMay was no longer going to be a part of the series, going to leave that season, was in this magazine. And I remember reading this. This is Cinema Fantastique, um, volume 20, number one. Of course, it has uh, Tim Burton's Batman featured on the front. But I remember seeing this at my local comic store at the time, which was Pinole Toy and Comic, and uh, I didn't buy the magazine back then. I actually just bought it recently off of eBay. Um, because I and I just remember flipping through this magazine and seeing this article about Friday the 13th, the series. So this article in Cine Fantastique, Friday the 13th, the series, third season horror bumps off regular John DeLamay. This was written by David Taggart. It says, Friday the 13th, the series, the number two rated show in syndicated television, returns in September for its third season with a two-part opener, The Prophecies. In it, the devil plans to make a sacred place, make lords, corrupt it, and plant the seas to shake people's faith. Stephen Monarch introduced last year as the cocky streetwise Johnny Ventura in Wedding Bell Blues, and as his father's Avenger in The Prisoner, joins Roby and Chris Wiggins in the weekly series as part of the cast of continuing characters. With Johnny, it's a chance for us to start playing rougher shows, said executive producer consultant Jim Henshaw. The Roby Monarch teaming is being planned to play The Heat. Uh, John DeLamay, who for two seasons as Ryan Dalian, has tried to redeem his uncle's cursed objects and outwit the devil, departs the show getting killed off in the season's opener. Dalian meets his fate in the form of one of Satan's hellhounds, a fallen angel. We witness the fact that we all are vulnerable, said Frank Mancusha Jr., Friday the 13th's executive producer, who also runs Paramount's uh, profitable film series of the same name. And yeah, uh, to say I was bummed would be an understatement. It happened 35 years ago, and... Uh, 
I remember thinking I, I was dreading seeing the first episode. How were they going to get rid of Ryan? Uh, what were they going to do? Were they going to really kill him off? Um, what they did wasn't exactly killing him off, but to read that article and know that the person that was so important to me on the show that I idolized, that I tried to dress like, that, you know, I was that age where, you know, you know, you, you sort of, you find people that speak to you, um, whether they have, you know, similar tastes in certain things like Ryan. I really liked right away when the show started because he liked comic books and art. That's what originally drew me to him. But as the show went on, I just, there was so many similarities between some of his character traits and things that have happened in his life that were similar to mine that I just, he just became really important to me. And as a 15 year old kid, it really, really fucked me up. And, uh, um, you know, the, I don't think I was very fair to season three of Friday the 13th, the series initially because of that. Um, I watched The Prophecies, which was uh, the exit of Ryan and sort of established that Johnny would be sort of taking over. The rest of that season, as much as I did like uh, Stephen Monarch, no disrespect to him, as Johnny Ventura, he just wasn't Ryan. And I respect that they didn't try to make him be a Ryan clone, that Johnny was his own guy, that he made mistakes initially early on, and that there was conflict between him and Jack. And I thought that was really kind of, you know, that was good writing. That was actually, you know, doing something that, you know, it wasn't just a smooth transition after Ryan left. And uh, when the show was canceled, I didn't find out. There was no internet back then. There was no way to know that it was canceled. I think I found out maybe a year after uh, the final episode, it was just over. And I've always been disappointed that they never gave it a proper finale, that they never wrapped everything up. You know, I think the show could have gone on for several more years. Um, it's it's still heartbreaking today, and I know it's been a long time since the show went off the air. I mean, it's been 34 years, and uh, but it's still, it's it, it's something I'll get into when I talk about the Dead Zone as well. Um, I don't like when things are never, you know, wrapped up. You know, I don't like when they just cancel shows without a proper conclusion. I think watching it now, I was able to appreciate it more than I was when I was a kid because the shock of my favorite character leaving just never, it never went away. Even, you know, as the series, as the season progressed and there was really some great, truly great episodes, some of the best episodes of the entire series, that uh, element being gone and that character that I adored being gone really just never left me and uh, I just couldn't embrace season three as much as I could the first two but I ended up liking the show a lot more um, giving it a rewatch um, some of these episodes I had seen multiple times but there was some I had only seen when they first aired back in 1989 and 1990 so it was really fun going back and re-watching them and I ended up really really enjoying a lot of them and um, yeah it was a, it was a blast I'm so glad that I did this series and I know it hasn't been gangbusters in terms of views uh, for my channel but I'm so grateful that I did this because I've been wanting to do this for a long time talking about this show and how much it meant to me and uh it just it's been so much fun and i feel like people are finally starting to watch them a little bit more than when i first put them out because i really felt like it was just kind of a a, a product of its time me, people hadn't thought about this show in a very long time and it really was a great show very well written terrific makeup effects um, I feel like it's timeless. It still holds up. And um, I think it came down to the fact that we cared about all these characters. Even Johnny, which I know a lot of people don't like the Johnny character. See, as season three progressed, I think the Johnny character got way, way stronger. I really, really respected Stephen Monarch's work um, as, the, as the season went on. So I'm going to jump into some uh, behind the scenes um, statements and interviews that Elise Wax did when she wrote her book. Um, it's going to be a little bit more than normal because there's a lot that happened uh, during the season, especially because of uh, John DeLamay's exit. And then I'm going to go into my breakdown of my top 10 episodes of season three. And after that, I will come back with my closing thoughts. And here we go.
John LeMay, Ryan Dalian. I don't feel like I was challenged enough ultimately. I wish I would have found a mentor who would have taught me how to dig deeper into the job of being an actor in a television series. I would have found somebody who would have helped me find ways to make the experience continually artistically enriching. I think I was immature and didn't find that on my own. As thankful as I am to be a working actor, I constantly want more out of life. I want to continue to grow. At a certain point, it felt like it just had to be me in front of the camera. That's my fault for not finding a way to be me in front of the camera, but also find a way to make the experience a continually growing one, and I didn't. Louise Roby, Mickey Foster. He had had enough, and he just left. I heard him in his trailer just trashing it around. Three in the morning, and I can fully understand. You are in full hair and makeup, and nothing happens for six hours. And it was often freezing cold. We shot in temperatures that were unbelievable. The extras were being picked off the fields like flies because they were just frozen. Frank Mancuso Jr., creator, executive producer. Syndication, syndication television is tough. It takes a lot of time in any television series you are going to do whilst providing you work, opportunity, and some money. It does limit what else you can do just by virtue of time it takes. This isn't uncommon, but some people think, well, I've made my mark here. Now it's time for me to go and exploit that and jump into this other thing. More often than not, it doesn't work out that way. More often than not, people look at you in a certain way. They like, they like you doing what it is you are doing. Then all of a sudden you are doing the other thing and that doesn't necessarily follow. Sometimes they do and I don't really know what happened to John after that, but I don't think he found himself in the center of something like that. Tom McLaughlin, director, story editor. Frank came to me at one point and said John LeMay was going to be leaving the show. I said, you're kidding me. He said no and made some classic Frank joke. The next like thing that is going to come out of his mouth is, do you want fries with that? I said it wouldn't be like that. He said, I know, it just pisses me off. Tim Bond, director. John LeMay's agent kind of made a little bit of trouble. She kept telling him he got the best out of the series, that he was a household name, that she could get in movies, all that stuff that agents do. He kind of fell for it and it started being a bit and started being a bit difficult on the set and showing up late when you show up late to a friday the 13th call that means showing up at 9 p.m and shooting until sun comes up so he made himself a bit unpopular on set i took him aside and said john i know what's happening paramount knows you're coming late they know you are trying to break your contract you don't want paramount to know that when paramount knows that everyone knows that they all call each other it becomes common knowledge you are a nice guy you are not a bad actor but it's going to be a tough road and to hoe to be a movie star i hope it happens for you but see this series through so you're not branded as a quitter of course he was young and he didn't listen at his agent's instruction he did enough things to cause paramount to terminate his contract they made a deal with him that they would let him out of the contract if he did the first double episode of season three they then replaced him with stephen monarch I worked with John LeMay about four or five years later on some series at Universal. He told me it was the first job he had had since he quit Friday the 13th. J. Miles Dale, line producer. John LeMay left, which no one was happy about because John was a very good actor and very charismatic guy, a nice guy. He found some loophole in the actor agreement to get out. Steve Monarch was a nice guy, but comparatively acting-wise, he was kind of a lightweight. He didn't have the same chemistry with Roby or with Chris. Steve Monarch, Johnny Ventura. I think they knew John was leaving the show, so they basically cast me to come up there and replace him. It was the pool cue episode. That was my first one. But they knew, and I knew I had a contract already. It wasn't like I was a guest star, and they decided to use me. I had to go to Paramount and audition, meet with Frank Mancuso Jr., the whole thing. They called me the next day and asked if I wanted to go live in Toronto. I said, okay. Frank Mancuso Jr. What became obvious was that it wasn't the same. They weren't the same. It had nothing to do with Steve. He was just a guy trying to do a gig. I thought he was absolutely fine. Had there not been a show with John LeMay before it, nobody would be complaining. You can like it less or you can like it more, but use the context you are supposed to in order to come up with a view on what it is. I got a little frustrated that people were taking shots at him like, John LeMay wouldn't do it that way. Right, so what? It's like the guy didn't want to do it anymore. What do you want me to do? I can't change his mind. That's not my gig. 
Stephen Monarch, it was like Roby's show. I came in and basically just respected what she was doing and was part of the structure. She was very supportive, and we had some laughs and some fun together when things got tough. We leaned on each other. She was always very sweet to me. Chris Wiggins is a wonderful actor. I learned a lot from him. He was like a mentor. He was awesome. He had the whole package. Very calm, debonair, very articulate, quite smart. He had a great humor, a very funny man. And now my top 10 episodes of the final season of Friday the 13th, the series, season 3. Number 10 is going to go to Bad Penny. This was episode 6 of season 3, episode 58 of the series, directed by William Fruitt and aired on November 11th of 1989. A crooked cop finds the hex coin and uses it for his own ends until Johnny steals it and uses it to restore his father to life. And this, of course, is a sequel to Tales I Live, Heads You Die from season 2. The Cursed Antique is the Coin of Zyocles. Um Bad Penny is a, it's kind of a, it's not my favorite episode, but there's things about it I really like. The Tales I Live, Heads You Die was a rough episode for me in season two because of what happened to Mickey um, and the, the fact that they lost the coin um, at the end of the episode when the temple collapsed. And this one, they get it back. I thought that Johnny using it to bring his father back was kind of stupid but at the same time i understood what johnny was going through um this causes a huge friction between johnny and jack it really made you miss ryan a lot there's actually a couple of references to ryan in this um the two cops weren't that interesting um i think the biggest uh part of this episode that really um is impactful is mickey being traumatized by the fact that the coin came back but still, Bad Penny has some good moments. I did think it was, it did add a little bit more depth to Johnny's character, and you really see the trauma that he's gone through since his father was killed, um, that that is sort of weighing on him, and that is why he makes the poor decision to use the coin of Zyocles to bring his dad back. Um, but yeah, not a terrific episode, but one that still holds a special place in my heart and one that I still enjoy watching. Number nine for me is going to be episode eight, Night Prey. This was episode 60 of the series, directed by Armand Mastroianni, and it aired on November 25th, uh, 1989. A vampire hunter steals a golden cross that kills vampires in order to get revenge on the vampire that turned his wife into a vampire. Uh, the cursed antique was the cross of fire, which can destroy vampires after the owner kills someone with a blade hidden in the cross. First time I watched this episode, I didn't like it um, at all. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, um, the other vampire episode of the series, The Baron's Bride, was so great. And this one just didn't compare for me. But rewatching it, I actually liked it. It does have a lot of erotic themes to it. Um, I did think The Cross of Fire was a really cool antique. I did think there was some really cool vampire effects in it. One really felt like it was right out of Salem's Lot where the vampires are covering, kind of hovering outside the church windows. But I just think there's some terrific visuals in this. And I did think the vampire effects were cool. And uh, I think it does have a very haunting end. And uh, again, everybody did a great job in it. Number eight for me is going to be episode nine, episode 61 of the series. That is Femme Fatale, uh, directed by Francis Delia, uh, aired on December 2nd of 1989. An aging director, Desmond Williams, played by Gordon Pinsett. Uh, frolics with a female lead character, Glenda, from one of his classic noir movies who convinces him to kill his wife. Cursed Antique is a 16 millimeter movie print that releases a character from the duration of the film as long as the live person takes their place in the deadly action. Um, this one was really interesting because it dealt with a director and his wife. Um, his wife is aging and sickly and he's able to use this movie print to bring the character she played in this classic film to life. But he has to put it like he has to sort of trick these women who are in love with his filmmaking into stepping in front of the projector and getting sucked into the film. And um, if he kills his wife, the real woman that played the part, then this character that keeps coming out of the film will be able to live in the real world. And I just love, you know, I love classic film and I've always been a, a lover of film. And I just thought this one captured that so well. And the fact that Mickey is the one that at one point is sucked into the film and is in danger of dying unless Jack and Johnny interfe intervene. And uh, it, it was really, there's some tense moments in it. And I just thought the black and white film and just the way it's presented, very well done. It's a great, it's a great episode. And it was one I had only watched 
probably two times uh, since it aired. So rewatching it, I just really got a lot more out of it and really just think it was a, it was such a well done episode. Number seven for me is going to be episode 12 of season three, episode 64 of the series that is Epitaph for a Lonely Soul, directed by Alan Croker. Uh, this aired on February 3rd of 1990. And mortician Neil Monroe, desperate for companionship, acquires a tool that brings back the dead. When he resurrects a young woman, her fiancé seeks help from the shop. The cursed antique was a mortician's aspirator that drains the life from one person then transfers it to a dead body, bringing it back to life. This was a really disturbing episode because it deals with kind of, I guess you could say necrophilia a little bit. Um, Neil Monroe, who had... Uh, unfortunately has passed away uh, really did do some of the strongest episodes of the show um this one this one was a very twisted one but it also goes back to some of the themes that we've seen throughout the series dealing with loneliness and um it's really a disturbing episode because you feel for the people that he brings back johnny isn't in this one this one is uh, mickey and jack and it's uh, a really good one and it's one that again much like uh, femme fatale it's one that i hadn't watched in a long time and uh, i really grew to appreciate it much more uh, giving it this second watch so, number six for me is going to be episode 13 of the season episode 65 of the series that being midnight riders directed by alan eastman aired on february 10th of 1990 jack mickey and johnny visit a small ha town haunted by the evil ghosts of bikers who were wrongly accused of rape and lynched meanwhile jack meets uh, the spirit of his deceased father for the first time in years there was not a cursed antique in this one um but uh the thing i love about this episode and really loved it revisiting it again because much like the last two i've talked about it was one i had not watched uh, since the series ended and since the show first aired so there's an episode in season one that kind of has a feel of the fog john carpenter's the fog but this one really felt like instead of lepers and ghosts this one is uh, motorcycle uh, bike rider ghosts and there's a couple of really cool moments in this episode like when they dig up the leader of the ghosts and he comes out of the grave with the motorcycle and his severed head and there's just some really good moments in this and really creepy moments and i just love the way the 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 ghosts of the bikers are, are shot it's just such a fun episode to watch and uh like i said really gave me vibes of john carpenter's the fog i also love the fact that jack's father was in this the actor they got to play him uh, his name is dennis thatcher um he looked just like chris wiggins um just the they just uh, with the beard and just the shape of his face i mean the actor just looked like he could really be chris wiggins father and i just love that dynamic because it was different you know we've known about you know a couple of people from jack's past but this was his dad and i thought that was really cool it just really felt like a good ghost story when you watched it and i just thought it, it all of the elements came together for me and it just really moved it wasn't even on my top 10 list before rewatching it so i'm glad that i did give it another chance because it really is uh, one of my favorite episodes of the season and probably the entire series number five for me is going to go to episode five of season three episode 57 of the series and that is stick it in your ear uh, directed by Douglas Jackson, aired on October 28th of 1989. The stage performer with a bad mind reading act acquires genuine telepathic powers and murderous compulsions. The cursed antique in this one was a hearing aid that allows the wearer to read minds, but the thoughts build up and must be transferred to another person, which will kill them. Um, Adam Cole, the character of Adam Cole is played by Wayne Best, and I would, and he's been, he was in other episodes like The Playhouse, and he was also in another episode from season three, that being Jack in the Box. And I just love his character. Uh, the Adam Cole character is really, you know, down on his luck kind of thing, starts to lose his hearing, and then he gets this hearing aid. And just the pain that you can see as the thoughts as he starts listening to more and more thoughts and as they build up and his face starts to bleed and you can see the pulsing it's such a painful episode to watch and very gross um i think this is one of the most disturbing like, probably next to better off dead from season two i think this is one of the grossest episodes of the show because the things that happen to these people when he has to transfer the thoughts into another person or if the wearer actually keeps the hearing aid too long and is killed by uh the absorbed thoughts it is the most painful thing to watch especially as they rip it out of their ear it's disturbing 
and gross and expertly added by Wayne Bess as Adam Cole. He is so good in the role and uh, one of my favorite uh, antagonists, I guess you can say, of the entire series. Um, such a terrific episode. Still pains me to watch it, but what a terrific episode and what a blast ending. It is, it is rough to watch, but so, so good. Number four for me is going to be the premiere of season three. That is The Prophecies. Uh, this would, of course, be John Delamay's last episode. Um, this was a two-parter. Prophecies counts as episodes one and two of season three, episodes 53 and 54 of the series. It was written and directed by Tom McLaughlin. It aired on October 7th of 1989. Um, the Prophecies deals with Jack heading to France to investigate strange events that have connected to a prophecy that will bring about the Antichrist. During the investigation, Ryan is turned into a serpent of the devil, and the only hope he has is a young girl who believes in God's love. The Cursed Antique is one of three books of Lucifer that makes the prophecies written in it real. Though magical, it is not one of Vondredi's antiques. Um, this episode is is rough for me to watch just because, again, you know, it's my favorite character's departure. And Ryan's fate is not exactly how it was described in that Cinema Fantastic episode, which was good and bad. Um, it was a strange way to um, take the character out, uh, but it didn't just outright kill him, which I thought was cool. So I kept thinking there was a possibility that he would come back, but he never did. These episodes are very dark and very disturbing. And I think why they don't rate higher for me is just because it still is sad for me to watch them because knowing that John would not be back after this one. So as much as I like them, I still think there are three other episodes that are a little bit stronger than it uh, in the season. Number three for me is going to be episode four of season three, episode 56 of the series that is Crippled Inside, directed by Timothy Bond, aired on October 21st, 1989. While fleeing from a gang assault, a girl is hit by a car and paralyzed. She then uses a magical wheelchair to reverse her paralysis and to kill her assailants. The, the Cursed Antique is a wheelchair that heals crippling neo-traumatic injuries by killing others and projects a dangerous ghostly double of the owner. Um, I love this episode. Um, it's a rough episode to watch. Uh, the assault at the beginning is absolutely horrible and you really love the rachel horn character played by stephanie morgenstern and while there are some despicable people in it the biggest despicable piece of shit in this is played like greg spottiswood who plays marcus um he is the biggest piece of shit douchebag uh ever and this was one where i was actually rooting for this girl to kill all of these people that left her in the state that she was in and this was also an episode where Johnny was kind of left on his own. And then Johnny is conflicted about taking the wheelchair back or letting Rachel fulfill, you know, her quest of getting revenge on these men that left her in the paralyzed state that she ends up in. And uh, it's got a very sad ending and one of my favorite endings with Johnny. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great episode. It's one that I've always loved. Yeah, Crippled Inside is one of the best episodes of the entire series. Number two for me is going to be episode 10 of season three, episode 62 of the series. And that is Mightier Than the Sword, directed by Armand Mastroianni and aired on january 20th 1990 an author calm fiora gets rich by turning innocent people into homicidal maniacs and, and and writing true crime thrillers about them while tracking him mickey becomes his next victim the cursed antique was a fountain pen that injects people with evil that forces them to do whatever their owner writes this is a brilliant brilliant episode again much like i said about season two's the maestro calm fior is just so good at everything he does and this one just is so brutal. But this episode really makes a turn when Alex Dent, the character Colin Fiora plays, um, injects Mickey uh, with this evil and makes her a female serial killer. Um, there are some really tense moments in this episode, and I just, uh, I thought this is one of Roby's strongest performances. And there's a haunting ending to this that some people thought was a cheap kind of little you know, shocking moment, but I thought it really played well because at first it really scared the hell out of me. And uh, it it's so good. I don't want to ruin it. Absolutely brilliant. But number one for me, and this has always been number one for season three. I love this one when the episode first aired, and that is The Long Road Home. This is episode 15 of season three and episode 67 of the series. This is directed by Alan Croker. 
and aired on February 24th of 1990. After recovering a cursed charm in another city, Mickey and Johnny run into a family of nasty rural degenerates while driving home. The cursed antique is a small yin-yang charm that enables the owner to transfer their consciousness into the body of someone they've killed. Uh, this was very much a Ed Gein, Texas Chainsaw Massacre feeling uh, episode. Um, the, the, the antique itself, the yin-yang charm, is picked up right at the beginning of the episode. Um, and while stopping to get a bite to eat before hitting the road, they run into the Negley brothers, Mike and Eddie, played by Angelo Rosacos, uh, one of my favorite actors from the entire series, and Giza Kovacas. Um, and they get into a little bit of a scuffle. They end up pulling the uh, gas line on Johnny's car, so the car breaks down right close to where the Negley's house is. And uh, it it's like a house of horrors. And... Um, there was also some really nice moments between Johnny and Mickey in this episode, and it didn't feel forced. It didn't feel like they were trying to force these two to become a couple, but you could see that there was a little bit of chemistry between them, and I was glad that they waited till like the 15th episode to sort of drive this one home a little bit. But uh, Steve Monarch, is this is one of his best performances. And while Johnny had started to come into his own in some of the earlier episodes before this, this is really the one that solidified him as a badass, and I really loved him in this one. And he did some really smart things in this one. And, of course, Mickey, the Mickey character played by Roby, also is amazing in this. And there's some really creepy moments, some really um, scary moments in this one. I think this is one of the scariest episodes of the entire series. And uh, just absolutely love it. Still one of my favorites. Um don't want to ruin it because there's some moments in this that you won't see coming. Fantastic episode, number one for me. Frank Mancuso Jr., creator, executive producer. The reason why the show was so successful was because we had big sponsors. McDonald's, Procter & Gamble, those guys. It wasn't like a bunch of local things. So when Donald Wildman started writing those places and saying... That he has all these followers and he's going to tell every single one of them not to use their products. If you continue to support the Satanist show and blah, blah, blah. I kept thinking that this was a joke. Until the McDonald's guys came around and said they love the show. They love the demographics. They love everything else. But we don't need this guy attacking us. It's easier, it's easier for us to find another show than it is to go ahead and fight this guy. Whether he has a premise or not. I thought this was really amazing. I knew that this would be the end of it, even though I was firmly on the belief that this guy had never seen the show. Stephen Monarch, Johnny Ventura. From what I remember, there was a rumor about some sort of organization that was trying to get us off the air. I think I was a little naive about what was going on because I was interviewed by the Associated Press and I said things that got kind of twisted. I actually got a call from Frank Mancuso Jr. himself asking me why I said the things I said. I told him I never said those things. They interviewed me and asked me if I ever had a chance to watch my show. I said I, that I really didn't get a chance because I was working all the time. I shoot at night and sleep during the day, and it's hard because it's actually a year behind in Canada, so I don't get to watch the show. Then they asked what it was that I don't like about the show. I said it was those cold mornings when you're shooting in just a t-shirt with candy-coated blood all over you. It gets a little uncomfortable, but that's about it. They then asked me about what show I was doing, and I said we were doing one about vampires. What came out was Stephen Monarch, the new sh star of Friday the 13th, doesn't have time to watch his own show, thinks there's too much blood, and thinks the people he works with are vampires. That happened when the beginning of the rumors were first going around, so I get a call from Frank freaking out, asking why I said that. I told him that it's that is not what I said. He said I need to be really careful when I speak to the media because if they are going if there is some sort of organization behind it that wants to ruin something, they will just change what you said. So that was kind of the part of the downfall. It wasn't because of me solely. I believe there was those organizations out there that really felt like the show was cultish and demonic and evil. Louise Roby, Mickey Foster. I secretly was sort of happy about the show ending because I was fed up. Jim Henshaw, executive producer and consultant. We had material in place for the two shows in season three that we never did. I remember we paid out the writers and probably paid out a few other people who were contracted for the episodes. We had four or five stories we were working on for season four. There were some new techniques and new software we thought we could use and do some interesting things with. We also, I think, had 
run across a couple of other actors that we wanted to use more. There had some minor characters on other episodes, and we, we started talking about bringing them back. At one point, we had even discussed having a thing where all the antiques that have been cursed in the vault go out so we could revisit some of those cursed objects, but do something different with them and really complicate the universe. You could have a cursed object that would operate one way for one person, then another way for someone else. It would really complicate the detective story and give the audience something they weren't expecting. It was like, we got a cursed camera and it does this, but for a different person, it could do something completely different. The audience and our characters would have gone into search knowing that it does what it does and knowing what to look for then suddenly be taken in a completely different direction. I don't remember any of the episodes that were cut. I know we would have been at outline stage for them, but probably not much further along. Stephen Monarch. I was kind of bummed that it ended the way it did. I felt like it really could have gone for another year or two, maybe three. I think the ideas were really good. When it happened, it happened really quick. It wasn't like, this is our last season. It was like, nope, it's over. This is our last week. That's not how it's supposed to happen. People to this day still contact me about the show. It plays around the world. Someone sent me an episode in which I was dubbed into Japanese. That was fun to watch. I didn't understand what I was saying. John LeMay, Ryan Dalian. Looking back, I do regret leaving the show. I wish I had been more mature and understood how to make the experience one that I could continually grow from. I wish I had found a mentor who would help me find that. I was put into different situations every week. There is no reason why I shouldn't have found that to be interesting and fun to do on a regular basis. We learn our lessons the hard way sometimes. Louise Roby. When the series finished, Chris sat down with me on the front steps of Curious Goods and said, You have passed your apprenticeship, my dear. That was some apprenticeship. Louise Roby quit acting after appearing in the direct-to-video thriller Play Nice in 1992. She married into British royalty in 1994 and had a son, James, but the marriage ended in 2001. Louise married again, a photographer who passed away in 2010. She currently lives in France, where she is working on a variety of music and writing projects. John DeLamay never quite became the movie star his agents wanted him to become. After leaving Friday the 13th of the series, John had a hand full of television guest spots and returned in Jason Goes to Hell the final Friday. He is still acting, though focusing on musical theater and most recently appearing in a musical version of James Joyce's The Deed in Los Angeles. John has entered the filmmaking space with Feet First Films, uh, directing videos and documentary shorts. He is married and has two daughters. Stephen Monarch continued acting and added writing and directing to his resume. Most recently, he has written, directed, and starred in Simpler Times, a short film starring Jerry Stiller that has been gaining acclaim on the festival circuit. Unfortunately, Elise Wax was unable to speak to Chris Wiggins about the role as Jack Marshak. While still alive at this point, as of June 2014, he was in poor health, and his caregiver said he was not available. Um, the hope was that he would get a chance to know about this book, and know that he left a legacy that lives on with fans. Chris unfortunately passed away on February 19, 2017 at the age of 86 from Alzheimer's. So that's it, my fellow fiends. And I want to thank everyone for taking the time to watch this video and support these three videos on my favorite television series of all time, that being Friday the 13th, the series. Um, I really miss this show. I really love everybody that was a part of this series. And uh, I'm, you know, it's heartbreaking, you know, doing the research on this and reading this amazing book by Elise Wax, knowing what could have been, you know, the fact that the show didn't have to be canceled, that the Christian right went after it, thinking it was a series promoting Satanism and devil worship when it was actually doing just the opposite. It was about people that cared enough to, you know, try to right the wrongs of Louis Vondrady and collect all of these things that were hurting people and could potentially kill others and locking them away when they didn't have to. And I just think it had a great moral compass. It had terrific characters, it had terrific acting. Um, 
I hope everyone uh, will leave some feedback down in the comments section below and let me know what they think of the show. If they've, you know, this has sort of enticed them to go and check it out. If they weren't, uh, you know, curious about it before, maybe they went and checked it out now because, you know, I've talked about it, you know, in these lengthy videos. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again for all the support. Thanks so much again for stopping by the Horror Zone channel. And I promise I will talk to you again real soon. Take it easy. Stay scared as always. Peace. Hey, my fellow Fright Fiends, I just want to thank everyone for supporting Boogeyman Ben's Horror Zone. If you haven't yet subscribed and you'd like to, please hit the subscribe button down below. Click the bell notification so you're updated every time I drop a new video. I try to drop a video at least once or twice a week. Uh, the Horror Zone is a passion of mine, and it really makes me happy that I can share that passion with all of you guys. Thanks so much again for the support, and I'll talk to you again real soon. Take it easy. Stay scared as always.